Welcome to Wild Earth this afternoon. Welcome to Juma Game Reserve on a very overcast day. We're very lucky that the rain has finally stopped. My name is Mark and we're very lucky that the thumb has returned and with the thumb, well, hmm, he's brought Brian this time. We, we weren't sure who the thumb was going to bring back, but welcome back, Brian. Thank you. I'm happy uh, to be back. Yes, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have you back. And of course, Tara back in final control. Alex is there as well. And well, from all of us here at Wild Earth, we're going to hope to bring you a fantastic afternoon this afternoon. There are a few great clouds, fairly low-hanging dark clouds, that might bring a little bit of a shower, but I'm going to be doing the Girl Scout trick and try and chase it all away. And we've got a couple of exciting things lined up. One of them, of course, is a, a new doing our, our garage carport talk this morning. Evidently, he made another kill. We're going to go and visit that site, and we're going to see what we can do there. And I believe that the Matembas and that Styx female have moved further south, but we're going to head on down that way anyway and see if we can find anything about what's going on with those lions. Other than that, we're going to see what this rain has brought. I mean, it's a little bit early to see whether there are any flowers out, but it is sh surely going to show us some things that has happened with the rain. One of the most important things about the rain is that it changes the ground. And it, it changes our interpretation of what is around us because for the most part every day that we go out that there isn't rain the there are new tracks on top of old tracks there is new, new news as it were uh, and for now it's almost as though that slate has been wiped clean it, it's almost as if if I could think of an analogy it's almost as if you have a chalkboard and you have chalk that fades over time and every day you write something new on the board, but you never wipe it off completely. And every day you write on top of the old writing from the day before or from the hours before. And the chalk has a te tendency to fade over time. If you can imagine that the chalk gradually falls off of the chalkboard. And that's pretty much what happens out here on the roads and in the, in, on, the, on the, the game paths that we pass. You'll find that. As, the, as the, the wind blows, and especially now with the dry leaves that blow across the road, it weathers the tracks, it smooths the tracks out, that only the new tracks are very, very fresh and very, very distinct. And sometimes it gets very, very hard to tell whether a track is six hours old or four hours old, and you've got to know how hard the wind was blowing or how many leaves are blowing across the road, whether it was aging the track or not. For now, though, we've had a considerable rain. It hasn't been just a light shower. That merely dampens the current tracks. We've had a considerable rain that there are no tracks from before the rain whatsoever. So everything is new and everything that we're going to see is going to be very, very distinct. The ground has, of course, become a lot more compact. So we're not going to be seeing those lovely little tracks, leopard tracks that we see in the dust. We're going to be very lucky to find maybe a hyena or a leopard track that's been... Uh, uh, where, where, where the animal has put its foot in soft mud. But on the, the normal sand, it's going to be very hard to read. We've got a rather flat light with this overcast conditions. So hopefully we're going to see some new ones. Of course, the hoofed animals are the ones that we're going to see very clearly, and I hope that maybe during the afternoon, because we don't really need light for these kind of tracks, the ones that are in wet sand, hopefully we can start looking at some of the different tracks. For now, however, just before we start the drive, we have one slight technical problem that I just have to apologize for. We need to return to go and get a particular tool that, funnily enough, we've never needed on drive before, and we need to, to, to get that to, uh, to adjust the camera. Uh, the camera is a little bit loose, and if we carry on right now, you're going to see a very bad wobble in the camera. So we're just going to go back to camp very quickly. It's going to take two seconds. And, uh, okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Call it two minutes and we'll be out immediately. So we'll see you shortly. Uh, I guess I'm hoping it was close enough to two minutes. Not quite as fast as the pit stops that we get today, but that was a quick one. Camera steady. I'm steady, Brian's ready, and we're off. It's the end of the week, I'm sure a lot of you are really happy about that. We're 
approaching a weekend. Well, you are. We are not. Every day out here for us is a fun day. And, well, Mondays can happen in any day of the week. It doesn't necessarily have to be a real Monday. So there are times that we have a Monday that can happen on a Sunday. If you know what I mean, you know, Mondays being that, that dreadful day. Now, we're out on our drive. Welcome to our safari this afternoon. And I do look forward to hearing from all of you out there whether you're going to... kind of gives me an impression of where I'm talking to. Not only who I'm talking to, but where I'm talking to. I, I haven't traveled very much, but I, I do have some knowledge of some of the other countries that we have viewers from. And it's lovely to get involved in conversation with you and, and, and dialogue over the, the difference in species or the similarities between environmental issues, all of those sorts of things. It would be great to hear from you. It's cold this afternoon. Well, not cold, it's cool. The, the rain has dropped the temperature considerably because there's a wind chill. Keep warm this afternoon. Temperature, I would say, is probably around 15 degrees Celsius. It's the overcast sky that we have isn't threatening at all. It's what we call a very, very high ceiling. I'd say it's probably about five, 6,000 feet, maybe even higher. So there's no rain underneath it. We don't get rain. This kind of cloud doesn't produce rain from such a high ceiling, what we call a ceiling. And it will there are a few lower clouds that are coming in from the south and it's maybe when the day it wears off that we'll get some lower cloud coming in that might bring some moisture. For now though we're safe. Interestingly, I've got a small group of impala here that I want to talk about because I'm on my left. Just beyond a little bush with some yellow flowers known as a senna. And there in your bottom left is the senna my flower for the ladies. And he's eyeing out this little group of females and lambs, ewes and lambs, which might be his. And here he comes, straight towards them, maybe because he feels that he needs... This is one of the first instances of impala rutting that we're going to experience right now. Watch. Are you going to do your noise, man? Ram, as far as I can see, there's one young ram, and I think he's going to uh, he's going to make a beeline for that. Maybe not. But that young ram is going to probably be pushed out for this rutting season. Two young rams, actually. They might be a little bit too young. There we go. Ooh. And he's already killed another one. Well, not another steenbuck, another antelope. It's an adult female impala. He's got it hanging in a marula tree. We're going to go and visit that shortly. Um, we have visited it during the day to see if he's there. Brent and Steph were out in the rain this morning towards Gowrie Dam, Juma Waterhole. And I'd be really keen to hear from any of your viewers who've been on the Juma Waterhole cam whether. He did pitch up and he was drinking down there. So the two impala that we're looking at now are actually two young rams of different ages. We've got a youngster in the front of us who's got his head down. He's only a few months, just his little ones old, horned by the show. And that's an older brother from the previous year. That's about a it's just under a year, a yearling, or well, just over a year.
hearing a bit of noise from the lodge. It could actually no. He's he's no. He's not a yearling. He's probably one of the first lambs of the season, and the other ram is one of the last ram, little rams of the season. And they're the only ones that are going to be allowed with the females during this rut. And if we look at November, so he's about a six month old ram, this little boy that we can see in the middle. The new one is only maybe two months old, three months old at the most. He's this little one that Brian is showing you now. He's, he's one of the later lambs. And because they're not mature enough, they haven't even been through puberty, they will be, no doubt, allowed to stay during the impala run. We're going to go and have a look, see where this male has chased this female. Interestingly, the other reason that they might split, I was thinking that maybe they split off from the main herd because that leopard might have made a play for them. There are a couple of scenarios that we could think of here. Either Kunuma, our young male leopard, made a kill during the night and, and, and in his attempt, or in his, actually it wasn't even an attempt, it was a, in his successful hunt, he split the herd up. But I'm starting to see, especially now watching this young male, or rather this big male impala, watching his behavior, I'm starting to think that he is now starting to collect a harem and looks like he might have lost one of his girls. Because normally Ram hurts his females and he keeps them together. He keep, if one starts straying from the group during the rut, he gets so upset and then of course he chases her back again. But of course, if she's faster than him, well, she can run to another herd and join up with another herd because of course the herd that they fall together with throughout the summer when there isn't the rut when these impala are all uh, cohabiting they form alliances amongst the females and they, they, they obviously blood relations there that they like to keep and the males don't keep that into account came tearing down here at a rate and it seems she was a little bit fitter than him. To them are down here, here they are. We, the, the kill that Kunuma is on is just off to our left, just behind us to the left. And, well, interesting, there is a bachelor herd of Impala here now, where he has chased this female. So the other scenario I was thinking of was that maybe there was a similar circumstance happening yesterday, that there was an Impala ram chasing a female, and they must happen to chance by Kunuma, wherever he might have been lying up, and he just saw this opportunity to jump up and catch that female as she was being chased by a ram. Because now we've got a situation where we've got three rams and this female, and they're not really a bachelor herd anymore, they're going to be in competition. And I think that's going to be about the best. And we bit forward. Got one, let's get beyond this dead knob thorn. Interesting question from Colin in Johannesburg here in South Africa. It's wonderful actually to get people from South Africa on our on our drives because we don't have the luxury of great bandwidth that you have in other countries. So it's board Collins. Why do Impala wag their tails? Well Colin, that's a fairly complicated answer but I guess the basic thing it's called flag signaling 
and we are trying to address it. It's probably linked to the little bit of a technical uh, well, uh, thing that we had at the start of drive. Okay, while things are fairly quiet here, the three rams seem to be doing their own thing. I think that I didn't see because we've been looking at microphones, but I think that that you has returned to her herd, and we need to go and have a look at, to see if we can find Kanuma. The cloud is lifting a little bit in the west. We're getting some beautiful light coming out. Not quite full sunshine, but bright enough that it's changing the changing the whole mood of the day. I'm just hoping if any of you can hear any difference in the sound, please keep us informed because, of course, we pick up things on our equipment. But of course, you, the viewer, all of you out there. Uh, if, if there's been anything really to do with that, that's got a lot to do with uh, co communication between individuals. A signal to carry on feeding and not be concerned with what's going on, or whether it's a signal to say, oh, there's danger and you need to take care of things. So I might have been wrong, Brian, but I'm not sure how. How's it reading on your camera? Yeah, fine, yeah. Sound wise. Mm. Okay. Final control. So I'm not seeing this little boy leopard. What I can show you is what he has done so far. Now we are right on the edge of the camp of Juma. It shows that these things take place no matter where the camp rather no matter where they are and that our presence doesn't really influence animals very much but we're very close to final control. Final control is less than 30 yards away. In fact, right through the bush, we can see the white of the satellite dish. And here in the tree on our left is, are the remains of a female impala. And I believe it was Konuma that did this. But he's been out all day. And I'm not surprised. He's a big, fat, stuffed cat. He's had an entire steenbuck up until yesterday. And then while he was still trying to digest the steenbuck, he managed to snag himself a big female impala, and he's eaten a considerable amount of it. He's eaten, by the looks of things, I would like to get a look at the, the remains on the other side of the tree. Look, I know this is gory for a lot of people. A lot of people don't like the blood and gore, but we are in Africa. This is the very point of what we do. So we are, I'm gonna talk about it briefly, but I won't go into too much detail. But he's, he's eaten a considerable amount of it, and it shows that he's eaten a lot of the high protein stuff, the stuff that he, he uh, is gonna give him the greatest benefit. And then in time, he'll chew on the smaller bits, as it were, if he comes back to it. Most likely he'll come back to it, even if it's only tomorrow. He's definitely needs, He's definitely got a full tummy and he needs to, to sleep that off for a considerable amount of time. For now, his kill is safe in a tree. There's not much that is going to get it. If a lion came right now, a lion would easily take it out of the tree because this tree is so easy to climb, even for a cheetah, which is not a climber. Cheetah's a running cat, but a cheetah could take a, a, a good run up on uh, the, the trunk of this marula tree. In fact, I can move positions and I can show you from a different angle. Uh, the marula grew at a, con at, at, at a slope. There's a big hole on the side that we'll see better if I move slightly. and you'll see that it, it, it's kind of leaning over because it looks like the main trunk might have died and over time one of the branches became the new trunk.
So even a, a, a tree at, at, at this angle is good enough for a lion or a cheetah to climb. You can see this big hole over here that is where maybe the original trunk was. There's also a very big, you can see it's about that big. That, that was a very, very large branch that used to grow out that way that broke off. And a lot of insects have gotten in there. A lot of the borers, a lot of the, the, the insects that take sometimes 15, 20, 30 years to reach maturity, their larva have been boring in some of that heartwood of the marulu tree, weakening its structure. Uh, probably why that, uh, that branch on the right broke off originally. But we're not going to harp on this carcass for too long. We've had a look at it. We're going to come back to it. So we're going to do a few loops. What we'll do is we'll drive out for an hour or so and we'll come back again in about an hour and have a look and see if he might come back. And in the interim, we're also going to be looking for him. We'll go down to Gowrie Dam. I'd like to hear from any of the viewers that might have been watching the camera this afternoon to see if any of them saw Kunuma the young leopard coming down to the dam possible that he might have gotten thirsty after eating so much the salt content of blood. Right. I suppose, yeah, the, 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 the blood is rather salty and although a lot of animals can obtain all their moisture from the blood that they eat, predators still need to drink water. So we'll make our way down to the dam and have a look. This is Boyatella, right on our left. It shows how close it is to the, the, the lodge. So if there were guests here at the lodge, uh, the blue, the, the, oops, I don't know how to do this like Peter does, but there's the blue of the swimming pool. Uh, and as we go past, maybe Brian can show you. So it would be very exciting for any of the guests at the lodge to be here. Of course, it would be discouraged for them to walk close by where this kill is, but it would just be that the, the knowledge that a leopard is on a kill so close to the camp must be quite fantastic. This is where Taylor Lodge here at Jumagay Reserve. We also traverse over Arethusa, Arethusa Safari Lodge, and there's a lovely dam at Arethusa. We will be visiting in, at some point, and we can show you how that looks. period of a leopard. It's about a hundred days. So just over three months for leopard. Most of the big cats are around that period, that length of time. That was a blacksmith lapwing that flew away from us by the way. And while I was talking you could hear that that sound that sounds like a, a blacksmith hitting an horseshoe on the anvil. The tink 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 tink. And that blacksmith was doing that because we drove past it. driving very slowly because I'm expecting to see a leopard here somewhere and I'm also surprised that these impala are still quite relaxed. So I think what I'd like to do is go down towards Twin Dams. Now I know that the lion that we're mating, which are the Matimba males, and that one sticks female, and I've got something else to add to that, thanks to Sil in Canada. Um, the lion that we're mating evidently moved to the south. Now they were very close. They were right on our southern boundary, and it was only a matter of time that took them back south because the lioness herself is the lioness of the Styx Pride and the two lionesses that we see of the Styx Pride are they're about the same age. I think we quite often people sort of refer to one as older than the other. I've heard that and I've always thought that but I was corrected just recently. And thanks to Saul who is quite familiar with all the lion here in the 
and Savi Sands. Uh, evidently they're about four years old, the two lionesses. And the last time we saw them mating, or one of them mating with the Matembas, well this Matemba, actually it'd be interesting still, I didn't really get that. Was she mating with this male, or was she mating with Ginger back in January? Look at this road, it's got deep ruts already from the mud and mud puddles, and the dove drinking. Oh yeah, distraction is the name of the game. It's got a lot of tail feathers or under tail feathers that are hanging loose. So it seems, it would appear that it's the same female that was mating in January that has been mating with this male now. I'm interested to know if it, I should know because I saw them, but I can't remember. So I need refreshing uh, and need an update from one of you out there. But, it's the same male that was mating with this female because now I know that I think it's the same female that was mating in January that was mating now which means she didn't conceive in January and so it's gonna there's gonna be this big question mark if she's gonna be mating now because we haven't really got that on camera yet we have seen the sort of beginnings of what was the male getting very very interested and that's mostly based on his olfactory receptive organs is Jacobson's organ at the back of the throat that picks up the, the female oestrus pheromones, the, the, the scent of the female in oestrus, and that prompts him to behave like the sick puppy dog that he was behaving like. And every time he approached her, she rejected him. I mean, it was literally a cold shoulder moment. We could see how she sat there and she turned her head and she didn't want him come near her, she growled at him. But by the same token, we watched how he kind of reacted. They were a lot closer than he thought they were, and his brother with the female got quite aggressive. This is for living in Canada. The sound of prayer is going through. conditions now we've got mud puddles to drive through too. Seem we might have just lost signal there for a minute. Uh, I need to explain something about what we have here on the vehicle. We basically got a a, a broadcast vehicle that news station, I suppose, it's the equivalent of TV stations use, but they have big closed bands that are not exposed to the ele elements or the elephants. I was going to say elephants first. <laughs> I think that explains it all. So they weren't exposed to the elephants. Um, our antenna that we have at the back of the vehicle has to be perfectly straight and sometimes if I go over a bump a little bit too much and then move the antenna it can lose signal very quickly and I'm sure you've noticed that Scott and Brent and, and Steph have mentioned it to you when we've been going out and we go through a dip sometimes going through the dip it's not so much that we go through a dip but what it is is that when we're going downhill the antenna is at a little bit more of an angle and, and that kind of does it because it's all got to do with microwaves and right angles and stuff that aren't elephants that I don't know anything about. But the elephants play a part. The, the elephants play a part, definitely. When you look at the side of Wendy. <laughs> the two big holes in the side of our vehicle. Welcome to Juma, welcome to South Africa, welcome to part of the Greater Kruger National Park known as Juma Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands. good question coming from Chris in Adelaide. Hi Chris. I'm going to have to take a guess. Chris wants to know how much rain we had last night. And I'm going to have to take a guess. In fact, this is a good example. We're, it's perfect timing, Chris, for this question. 
because if we look at this drainage line, and this is going to be one of the first key indicators of the amount of rain. And I might have to, to invoke the depends clause, but if we have a really if we have a lot of rain, then there's so much runoff. If there's so much rain that it, it can't soak into the ground quick enough, there's a lot of runoff and this is what creates these drainage lines is that little variations in the topography run into bigger and bigger streams and eventually they run into a little drainage like line like this and this runs into the Mawati River and there are hundreds of these running into the Mawati River that eventually after time all of that water accumulates over time. Now we sat here sometime earlier this year with water running underneath us and I know that there are some screen caps and there are some photos of this very drainage line flowing and it would be great to compare the two right now. Maybe I should just take a quick photograph because I might have taken a photograph of it at the time and if if nobody else can find it then maybe I can and it'll give you an idea somehow we'll put it on the Wild Earth site and we'll, we'll, we'll post it. But an indication that it wasn't really that much rain in that there is no sign of any surface water running down this drainage line right now and that one thing tells me that it was probably not more than about 50 millimeters, maybe two inches of rain. Just in case I've got this photograph somewhere, I'm going to see if I can just replicate it and put the two together see the difference the other thing is that when this rain started last night it started with a bang uh, it was the most incredible light show and I hope some of you I hope there were some of you that might have caught it in either Arethusa cam because the rain it all came from there actually it was thundering it was it was pelting down over Arethusa before it came to Juma because it seemed to come in from the west which in itself is rather unusual, although the whole storm came up the escarpment from the south. But it, it, it was coming up in the west at sunset. We had the most beautiful sunset. And then all of a sudden, this whole thing swung to the northwest, or rather the northeast, came in from the, the west and the southwest, and pelted down. The initial rain was so much rain that there was runoff. We had r streams running into camp that some of the guys were getting worried that the water was actually going to accumulate and run into their rooms on the lower side of our courtyard. Fortunately, it started abating just before it reached that point. And then from then on, it was just a, a steady drizzle for most of the night. So the very good thing is that, it, 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 that, that intensity of rain wasn't consistent enough or, or persistent enough to get these drainage lines flowing and we're going to go through. In fact, we're going to the Mawati. We'll see where some of the water has flowed down into the Mawati. We're going to do that right now, in fact, and then head south. That'll be a very good idea to see how much the rain has washed the sand clean. Um, absorbed every single drop of it that has fell for the last 18 hours, I would imagine. Kristen, forgive me, we, just bear with me for one minute, because, we, we, well, we are where we are, and we're going to check. This is a little pan of water, still at this time of the year, but because we've had a very bad rainfall season, I want to see if there was enough rain to even create a little puddle, because up until now, this is, yes, it has, look at that, it's a 
we likely to find buffalo again here in the mud. This has been very, very dry. This is a little pan known as Chella Pan. Kristen was asking if we have Dick Dick in the area, and I promise I'm going to get back to that question because I want to give it some time, and it's just a matter of looking at this right now. A little bit of rain because of the clay layer that exists here. Uh, it's managed to catch with the water that has fallen and it is the very reason why. This is a natural pan. This is not man-made. This is made by buffalo and elephants and rhino and all sorts of animals that have wallowed here over centuries maybe. And every time they come and wallow, they take away the mud. You can look at that mud that is accumulated on the trunk from animals rubbing themselves after they wallow. And every time it does fill up with water and animals do come in and take the mud away, it gets a little bit deeper, a little bit bigger. But I was asked this morning that whether we use this clay with this lovely rich matter that the sediment of these little pans, whether we use that as fertilizer or as, 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 well, yeah, I guess as fertilizer. And one of the reasons why you can't interfere with it is because it is a process that is vital to maintaining a little aquatic ecosystem. It is a clay base that needs to be then. If you take it away, you can actually damage that clay base and it might never hold water again, in which case it just becomes a dust bowl and maybe eventually something might grow out of it. But it's vital to leave it there for other reasons. And that is because there is an incredible amount of life that lives in these little temporary pans over the season, over the summer season, the wet season. Uh, we don't get them here, but there is a species of fish. We get the other things that we get. There are frogs, many different types of aquatic insects, a couple of different types of aquatic spiders, uh, aquatic crustaceans. There's a little thing called a fairy shrimp, which is a very, very interesting little creature. Mostly interesting because no males exist, and it's a kind of creature that reproduces through what we call virgin birth or parthenogenesis, parthenogenetics. Um, all sorts of creatures that exist and things that will come back again and eggs that might stay dormant over the dry season. The chela pan, known as frog pan, chela means frog in Shanghai, the local language. And we have many times, well, a few times in the past. I have done it once, but I think we've done it before I did it. But we spent a night here. We brought the jigger out, and we parked it next to the pan in the middle of the summer amongst the cacophony of sound of so many different species of frogs. And we tried to identify a few of them. I put on some latex gloves, and we tried to, we tried to do a sort of frogging expedition. It's very difficult to do because they're very, very sensitive creatures, and especially now in this day and age, frogs are getting a fungus that is killing them off worldwide. It's a fungus known as Chytramidia, and, and, and it, it, it's really not good to handle frogs with our naked hands because of the oils or the, the, the bacteria or the fungi or the kind of oils even that we have on our hands. Now frogs absorb a lot through their skin. Frogs that get thirsty now, or the frogs that have been thirsty, tonight is going to be a night that we're going to probably see, and unfortunately we won't be able to see them, or we might, just before the end of drive, toads and tree frogs that are going to be coming out, and they're going, it's their last, probably one of their last chances to rehydrate before the dry season, and the only way for them to rehydrate is to sit, to squat in the water and they absorb water through the skin on their back legs and to, uh, to their lower back because they can't really drink water. It's going to be interesting to see what life might exist after tonight or rather what might come out. Now an interesting factor is that this pan has been dried and there are obviously eggs and things that remain dormant throughout the dry season. And if any of them were to hatch right now, it would be quite detrimental to the species because quite clearly if we get one or two hot sunny days, this water is going to be gone. And that's far too quick for any of these creatures to complete their life cycle. So there's a very interesting thing that happens is that the eggs themselves are triggered by hydrostatic pressure. I think it's called hydrostatic. Let's put it this way. When the water is deep enough, the pressure of the water is strong enough that the eggs hatch and somehow nature has made it that only at that certain pressure
but to ensure that the water is going to stay there long enough for their life cycle to occur because well if the water dries up and they die before they've become adults they don't get to breed so the species doesn't really exist for very long does it so much interesting stuff did i hear him thought i heard something no i did thought i heard an elephant Let's take a quick look. There's a go-away bird coming to drink. Go ahead. You might have heard us, one of us, all of us, any of us presenters talking about high felt and low felt and escarpment and Gail is asking, hi Gail, Gail is asking if I can explain the terms low felt, high felt and escarpment. Quite easily Gail, we have a mountain range to the west of us at this stage of its, at this stage of its geographical distribution. Um, th this mountain range is a north-south mountain range called the Drakensberg, which means Dragon's Mountain, because looked at in its entirety, it looks, it's got the undulation of the Dragon's It is also one of the It is also one of the longest mountain ranges. And that is what we call the escarpment because the, the, what lies beyond the Drakensberg is ground that is about five, anywhere from four to six thousand feet high, as opposed to down here where we are. We call the low felt on the lower side of the, escarp the escarpment, the eastern side of the escarpment. And this is called the low felt because it is much lower in altitude. And it's a really flat, relatively flat. We're only at about a thousand feet here. Relatively flat all the way to the east where Mozambique is. And from the base of the mountain to the base of the escarpment, uh, you suddenly get this, this huge altitude variance where it gets up west from us. It's considered high felt. And it has obviously different topography, different geology is considered high felt and it has obviously completely different topography, different geology, different climate, different conditions, different vegetation, different period. Now I'm, I'm taking a look at Okay, back in the riverbed signal might be an issue because we're deep in the riverbed also that Bye. 
So I just had to get back out of the river bed there. It seems that we are having a bit of a signal now. The one thing about signal that is different on a wet day as a dry day is because everything that is wet is absorbing some of it as far as I'm aware. It is a microwave signal. So things, when we do get a bad signal area, um, Sometimes it gets a bit worse when things are wet. I, would swim. I thought I heard something through the bushes here. There were some tracks of a buffalo back there, and it was most probably a buffalo. Um, I, need, I was asked if uh, where are we going next. I have to be honest, I don't know. We don't have a plan. There's no such thing as a plan when we're driving, unless it comes to going back to see where the leopard is. But the, the beauty about driving around is spontaneity, and if we have a plan, uh, well, we can't plan anything because we don't know where anything is. The beauty about what we do here in the middle of the African bush shop is we can get to a junction and a bird could fly to the right and we could then take a right turn just because the bird was flying that way. Not seeing much in the way of tracks at the moment. So I haven't got any tracks to follow. The original idea is to maybe just keep heading south because we're on Twin Dams Road. I want, we want to look at how much of the surface rain, how much of this runoff has occurred and how much maybe, how much water was surface runoff, how much is soaked in. I think most of it is soaked in. The idea is also I'd like to find a road that hasn't been driven. This is clearly a road that's been driven. There are two sets of vehicle tracks here and it would be nice to find roads that are pretty clear of, of other vehicle tracks mostly so that I can find out kind of new stuff. But we're going to try and visit the riverbed again. I wanted to try and show you whether there was any water flowing into the Milwaukee River at all. Now these are another couple of pans. There's a big Nyala bull by the way. A couple of pans here too that have filled up with a bit of water. We often find mud, these mud wallows tend to retain quite a bit and we're no doubt going to see buffalo in these pads in the next couple of days. Quite a shy and yellow bull. I'm feeling a lot more secure now that he's very, very close to that very dense Tambuti thicket. Down into the river bed, hopefully, signal will be, be good in this section. One of the indicators that I've noticed here at Juma, we're at a, a, a confluence of several roads, roads and river. And Good afternoon, Squire. There are two major drainage lines that converge where we are, as well as several roads. And when we do have a very heavy rain, 
with a lot of runoff, uh, this is where we see it. This is the most notable place that we see it. Now, there's nothing on the sand here at all, but just in front of me, where that is Battalier Road that's coming down. You can see the very dark patch in the sand. I'm going to get closer just after Brian zooms in now. But this shows that there was a little bit of water running down into the Mulwati River that has resulted in that little pool of mud, that little pool of very, very fine sediment that is collected. But that is about as far as it went. And getting back to an earlier question of how much rain I think fell, and until I find a rain gauge, until I, I get it from Mike, and I'm sure Mike, at, who, who, who's involved in that here at Voyotella, until I get that from Mike, I can only guess that it must have been anywhere from maybe 30 to 50 millimeters, because not that much water. It seemed like a lot because it was kind of like a sponge. The bush is drinking it all up. And it was only the initial rain really that brought down enough water to create a puddle here for a little bit. You can now make it, you can see how much clearer it is from above. How it would have run down the road and Settled. There's even a little bit of erosion, like about an inch of erosion off of the road coming through as it ran down. Okay, let's get over to Twin Dams. Maybe we'll, hopefully it will be fine to travel the riverbed. Let's try and do that. Try and drive down the sand. See, the Nyala was here, so now I've, instead of driving the road, we're going to drive the sand. Then we'll drive back along the road, because it, by the time we get to Tundan, which is south of us, if we follow this this riverbed, by the time we get to Tundan, it's going to be time to go back towards Gary Dam and to see if we can catch up with that leopard that killed that Nyala, because we're going to have to go back there later. Oh, we're going to have to stop by there every now and then, because at some point he's going to get cold and hungry and he's going to want to wake up and he's going to want to go back and feed because... Oh my word! This Nyala has found another Nyala and I can't see the other Nyala but I can see by his behaviour. Just there. It's just there on the left I think. Yeah. Okay, let's get a nice good view of this boy because very so we so seldom get to see this behavior the strut the slow motion strut the white dorsal crest is raised as high as he can he's flaring his tail I'm hoping oh, we can't really get closer to them we've got to get up onto this floodplain to be able to get closer to them but they're gonna strut this stuff they arch their their necks, they, they sort of point their horns forward and they will circle each other like this. We might see the other one coming into view shortly because it seems he's doing his dance, uh, curving to the left a little bit. He might be curving to the left because the other male is at the left and the other male will be coming from the left, curving to his left, which will be to our right. It's a dance that these Nyala do in competition with each other, completely different to the way Impala settle their differences or settle the score or any other any other antelope or any other male vying for, for dominance. Nyala are unique. Right, let me see if I can climb up this. Bankment. I don't think I don't know if I can, but we can try. Of course we can, it's a mangrove. You can see 
see the other male now. He's not really taking up the challenge, to be honest. And Bush is a little bit thick. Well, now he is. Now he's starting. He's going the other way, not the way that I imagined he might. I can't go further. There's a bush willow being pushed over right in front of us. Uh, unfortunately, also, there's so much spike thorn and bush willow and guari here, we can't really see, but he will be coming into view shortly. But just a little bit of patience, and we're just going to be a little bit quiet. This is kind of life in slow motion. So, let's call it super slow motion. Super duper slow. <laughs> this is super duper <laughs> slow. <laughs> this is about as, as, as slow as watching paint dry. <laughs> A little, uh, bit <laughs> a little bit more exciting, though. A little bit more exciting. Infinitely more exciting. He's going to come into view now. But I want you to take note of the posture, how he's, he's, he's holding his head. And oh, we've got the other male coming into view in the background. They're going to pass by each other. Just behind a very scraggly little bush willow. The mane, the dorsal crest, the tail, every hair of the body standing erect, even the lighter hair along the foreleg, or rather hind legs, the front part of the hind legs. He had that leg poised for over a minute. And the ox peck is interfering. <laughs> Not really ox peck, choose the wrong moment. Because of the birds that are on the animal's back. They can be pesky little things.
So these are two Nyala bulls in their prime. Lynn wants to know, hi Lynn, Lynn wants to know if they make any noise while they're doing this horn. Hi Lynn, and uh, Lynn's in Michigan by the way, I hope Michigan's warming up a little bit, but no, as you can hear Lynn, it's an entirely silent dance, no noise whatsoever, in fact they're making every effort not even to make a noise with the hooves. When the front leg lifts up, almost the back leg goes into the spot where the front leg was. And this is a silent dance. They don't want to draw any attention to themselves. Not like Impala that makes so much noise during the rut. The way Impala rams do it, no wonder so many of them get caught during the rut because they get so involved in this, this, this dominance thing and the snorting and the running and the, and they get they get so distracted with fighting each other that they become easy target for lion leopard and cheetah and wild dog and hyena but these boys they know how to do they they find a nice little patch of riverine forest and they do their dance and this can go on for hours I mean this this week we, we could be here till nightfall but I think it's really, really incredible that we've been able to watch this, that they've been able, that they have continued to do their little dance with our presence, with the vehicle sitting here. Now that they've moved out of sight, and I can't really move much closer to them. I think it's maybe time that we leave and we head down towards Twin Dams. And I, I, I haven't heard anything on the radio and unfortunately it is a different channel property south of us where the sticks and the matimbas have gone don't have the same radio channels that we do so I can only depend on maybe seeing somebody on the common boundary but we still we're going to go down there we're going to look for tracks because maybe they've been walking around maybe they've come back towards Twin Dams thank you boys and just don't get too nasty will they ever butt ears? yes they, 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 they would when this whole dance, a good question, Brian. This whole dance is about dominance, and the, the it can read, it can mostly get to a point where the, the the less dominant male is going to acquiesce, and he's going to eventually just what what he's likely to do is he's going to go and feed displacement activity, maybe horn a tree or something, because he can't take the pressure, and the other male might then go ahead and and. and not challenge him anymore and, and it, it might sort of dissolve just from this kind of a, a behavior but if there are two males that really really want to have a go at each other because this dance is not going to settle it look what landed on my hand hello grasshopper pretty little thing yeah, he was turning to say hello Beautiful camouflage. <laughs> bye bye, Grosopa. Nice to have known you. <laughs> you break my heart. <laughs> you left so soon. A whirlwind romance. A whirlwind. <laughs> whirlwind romance. I think Missy Kai is open at the moment. This, by the way, you'll hear me talking on it every now and then. This is our game drive radio. This is the radio that I have in connection. Or I'm connected to uh, all the other vehicles that are driving around on our channel, on the Juma channels, what we call the northern or the western, or rather eastern channel. And every now and then, in the middle of something, I might have to pick this up and talk to somebody that you can't see or hear. And that is because we have to share information. We have to be in contact with each other all the time to know what's going on but also because we don't like to pressure animals and 
it's important that only two vehicles or maybe three vehicles are with any animal at any one time any of the major animals that we need to see and so we need to be in touch so that we don't pressure it. the game drive channel you'll hear that happening every now and then by the way Amazing question. Oh wow! I've got a question from a place called Hamanskral, which is here in South Africa. A chap by the name of Sibusiso. Hi there, Sibusiso. Molo. So born. Oh wait, I've just got to show you the red tamboti leaves. As good as flowers, ladies. Red tamboti leaves, as good as flowers. But a very interesting question, Sibusiso is uh, a beekeeper by the sounds of things and has got a beehive and he's seen snakes coming out of his beehive we're going to be seeing sorry Sibu Sisu excuse me a second and I've got another question to answer earlier too that I forgot about but this love the lovely change in color of the Tambuti leaves I love it Interestingly, the, the Nyala don't eat the green leaves, but they will eat the red leaves when they fall. And it's most likely because the Timbuti is part of the Euphorbia family, which all, that family of plants, all have a very poisonous milky latex. And when the, when the plant draws all its nutrients out of its leaves, they change color and they start falling. And I guess then the milk isn't as toxic as it is when it's on the tree but you'll often find Nyala eating the red leaves on the ground. And while we're thinking of flowers, there's one flower I can see up ahead. I've been dying to find a flower for the ladies out there. That is a, yeah, a little white one. If there's a flower, I'll find it. A little white flower known as a Barlaria. See, but see, so I've never heard of snakes in beehives. I, I don't know of any relationship that snakes have with bees. Of course, I'm not the expert. I have, however, have kept bees before. And that was down in the Cape, though. Excuse me, it's got to talk on the radio. Mark, yeah, go ahead. Kobe, thanks. Barleria, B-A-R-L-E-R-I-A, -E -E Barleria. So in the time that I was keeping bees and making honey, I didn't find that at all. Uh, and I would be interested to know, are you sure the beehive is still active? Uh, and I, I know, for me, it's probably a, sorry, but it's probably a stupid question. But um, I did have, there was one time that one of my hives, this, the whole hive died. And I didn't know about it because uh, just the timing that I was there to check might have been that there was just no activity. It was only a while later that I realized that the whole house, something had happened to the house, as has probably happened in many countries all over the world. A little bit more mud and things developing here. And this, this is Mumba Road crossing, a lot of runoff here. Interesting, so we'll see if you've if you've heard of this new method of beekeeping amazing somebody posted on my facebook page it's fantastic and i wish this is for Australian guy father and son beekeeper duo that have developed this beehive that you don't have to crack open the hive anymore you don't have to you, you, you don't have to do any of the damage to the hive that, are, that, that has happened up until now 
um, in terms of extracting honey. The whole process of taking the leaves out and spinning them in the barrel and extracting the honey that way, putting them, disturbing bees, maybe squashing some of them, all of that. There is a new method of beekeeping that is revolutionary. And what it is is that they have these pre-designed honeycombs in two parts that the bees actually then complete. And there's this little lever that when it's time to crack the hive, you don't even have to open it. What you do is turn the lever and it just moves the two edges apart to let honey drip out and you literally have honey on tap. It doesn't disturb the bees, they just carry on doing their thing and well, it's quite amazing. I forget what it's called, but it's I wish we had it in South Africa. I know there's sort of crowdfunding need and what have you, but it's it's probably the most revolutionary, most amazing idea in beekeeping that has is, that is ever come out. Of course, our biggest problem here in South Africa and this part of the world and down in the Cape as well, in fact, in many parts of, of rural Africa, are honey badgers, keeping the beehive away from honey badgers. One of the best things, or one thing that I found, I managed to build these um, tripods on stilts for the, for the well, you could put a four-legged stand or anything in as long as it's off the ground um, it'll be fine and as long as it's it, it's there's nothing that a honey badger can climb thin legs nothing that they can push over as long as it's off in the ground in fact sometimes a 44 gallon drum works to put a beehive on top of a 44 gallon drum to keep them off the problem is of course that they are very strong little critters and they can push things over very easily so you've got to make sure that they can't push it over but yes that is our main challenge, beekeeping in, in, in Africa. Up in East Africa, they don't even have the boxes. They don't have all of that. They just take a hollowed out piece of wood and they hang it from a tree and the bees come and do their own thing. And that's how they manage to keep bees in East Africa. Very interestingly though, beekeeping has become an alternative to keeping elephants away from crops because elephants are so particular about bees. Elephants hate bees and as a result it's found that if they if you can if you can manage a few beehives, several beehives around the crops that you're growing, you can keep elephants out of your crops. And of course you have the added bonus that you've got this nectar that you can produce that is like liquid gold at the moment because honey is becoming so expensive. It's unbelievable switch off and listen because if those cats are anywhere nearby and they are mating please stand by and they are mating um, we want to be able to hear them because every time they do mate there's likely to be roaring so I just want to sit listen quietly Brian is going to see if he can find you the odd thing on around the dam. There's a blacksmith lapwing to begin with. Just wanted... I think while we're sitting here, we can take a question or two. I know that Final Control did have a question for me as we were arriving, and I just wanted to sit and listen for a bit. You can hear a Franklin. You know, sitting and listening is very important because while reading the tracks and the roads 
is part of our update, part of how we read what's going on in the world around us. It's very, it's very important for us to sit and listen sometimes because we've got to use all of our senses. In fact, even sometimes we use our sense of smell. But what's also important is our sense of hearing. And when you are in tune with nature and you recognize different sounds, you recognize either sound ceasing or sound starting or the lack of sound or excessive sound, they can tell you all sorts of things, what animals are, are doing or re rather what might be happening around us. And sometimes it's just really nice to sit and listen. And we're going to move a little bit closer to the dam or maybe we'll just go a little bit towards the other side of the dam and we'll stop there and listen a little bit more. Um, I do hear something alarming. So, I think we had a question from Valerie. sent an email wanting to know the difference between insects and bugs. Why aren't all insects bugs? Oh, there's a random shoulder blade. I know where that's from. At least I think I do. Very old shoulder blade. Been chewed heavily by hyena and things over the years. But there's a buffalo kill here many years ago. The Majingila and Lion Coalition killed the buffalo here one day. We can see some of the other some of the other parts of the skeleton just on the other side of the dam wall. But I'm gonna stop again. I'm gonna to talk to you again. Valerie wanting to know about insects. Why aren't all and is an eagle flying too? Why aren't all insect bugs or what are bugs? Well I know that in, in many parts of the world, anything with legs is called a bug. But in, in real terms, when we talk about nature, bugs are just one type of insect. See, now there, there's some Franklin that are alarming, and I've heard some starlings alarming. That could be to do with this eagle that's flying around. It looks like a brown snake eagle. Gone. Mm. Yeah. Looks like a brown snake eagle. So the alarming that we're seeing, or rather hearing, could have something to do with the snake eagle being there. So Valerie, they're about, I think, I don't know, I might be a little bit old-fashioned because I might not have up-to-date information because there might be new discoveries that I don't know about. But I think there are about 32, if not 33, different orders of insects and the order, in, in, in the nomenclature, in, in the breakdown of creatures, it's like there are many different types of mammals. So I want to use the analogy. If we look at insects, insects are this one group of creatures. You get insects, birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians, mammals. Those are sort of major groups of animals. Now, in the animal kingdom, amongst the mammals, you will get, that's a turtle dove by the way. In the mammals you will get all different types of mammals. You'll get carnivores, insectivores, insectivores um, herbivores. And, and, and anyway, they, they're all divided up into different categories. 
Now insects are also divided up into different categories and bugs are but one category of insect and they're very, there's a very specific physiology, a very specific makeup of what makes a bug as opposed to all the other insects. Now I know I get a little bit, I get a little bit uh, uh, sticky about calling everything a bug because there is only really one type of insect that is a bug and all other insects are different. I mean, they are, other than bugs there are ants. One category is ants, bees and wasps. They fall into one category because they're all related. Another category are the mantids, the praying mantises. Another category are the grasshoppers and the crickets. Another category of insects are termites. And another category are things called thrips, which are a pain for those of you who are trying to grow vegetables and do your own gardens. Another category of beetles. Another category of insects are bugs. Very specific shape, very specific type of animal, of insect. So it's, it's more that there is a generic use of the word bug in that many people all over the world just refer to anything as a bug. So it, it, technically it's not really correct because there is only really one insect that is a bug and it's just, I suppose, being specific or not. I hope that answers the question. I'm not going to tell you what this is because it's cold and it's puffed up. It is a dove, I'll give you a hint. But because it's cold and it's puffed up, you can't really see any finer details, so it might be a little bit of a hard. It can only be one of two, and I'm going to ask somebody to send a tweet or an email to tell me which type of dove this is. Pretty little thing. One of the smallest doves we get here. One of, because there is a smaller dove that does occur. Looks quite different when it's cold. Eh? It does. Yeah. I know I missed the question earlier, I was supposed to get back to it after Chela Pan. I don't know if I addressed that one and I'm going to rack my brain to think of it. Okay, we're at Twin Dams. This is where the lion were starting the mating ritual a couple of days ago. 